please take your seats. Commercial opportunities in the Indo-Pacific region. Economies in the Indo-Pacific region are among the fastest growing in the world and have immense opportunities for commercial developments. Our panelists for the session will offer insights on which sectors will see this growth and how countries in the region can create welcoming environments for companies interested in meeting this growing market demand. The moderator of this panel is Kasem Sid Patom Sak, the Deputy Secretary General for the Thai Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator on stage. And now let's meet our first panel, Jay Collins, Vice Chairman, Corporate and Investment Banking at Citi. Brian Davis, President of ASEAN at Honeywell. Gopsak Pudragun, the Deputy Secretary General to the Prime Minister of Thailand. Kimberly Reed, President and Chairman of the Export Import Bank of the United States. Exim. Mr. Batom Sak, thank you and please get us started. Thank you. We all okay, the mic is good. Well, good, e good morning and uh, welcome to the first panel of today's uh, Indo Pacific Business Forum. Uh, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone, especially friends who travel far and long to get to be with us here to today. Uh, we have um, an excellent panel of speakers with us today and uh, I don't even know how to begin to introduce everyone individually with their elaborate uh, profile and uh, CV so I'm going to ask uh, as for the benefits of everyone uh, just to go around and introduce yourself at this stage. Jay? Yes, uh, my name is Jay Collins. I'm a vice chairman of banking at Citigroup. Uh, City has been in the ASEAN region since 1902, um, and we cover everything from consumers to private bank, uh, corporate banking, investment banking, markets, transaction services in the region, from governments to large global corporates to uh, all of the local corporates, including many of the Thai businesses in the room today. Thank you. Good Ryan. Yeah, hi, good morning everyone. Brian Davis, I'm the uh, president for Honeywell ASEAN. I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I've had the pleasure of living in Asia for over eight years, the other five years in China. Uh, we're a Fortune 100 company. We have over 110,000 employees globally. We have 4,000 employees in the ASEAN region operating out of six primary countries with 10 manufacturing sites and a brand new corporate headquarters we opened up in 2017 with over 500 employees in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Oh, Thank wow. you for welcoming us today. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Kopsak, please. Uh, good morning. My name is Kopsak Putakun. Um, I've been working in Thailand for almost 22 years. Um, the first 15 years working at the, Res the Reserve Bank and then also Stock Exchange of Thailand. And I moved to the Commercial Bank, the largest one, Bangkok Bank. My duty there is to take Thai investors to go outside to the regions and explore the opportunities in the neighboring country and also in ASEAN areas. Um, later on, the past five years, I've been working with the government um, in various roles and um, currently I'm the secretary to the economic minister cabinet. Um, we control all economic policy in Thailand and I help Dr. Somkit, the DPM, uh, in supervising the National Planning Board, the Board of Investment, Digital Economy Agency, and others. Thank you. Chairman Reed. Swadika. <laughs> it's so great to be here today. I'm Kimberly Reed, uh, President and Chairman of the Export Import Bank of the United States. Exim is the official export credit agency of the United States. Uh, we've been in operation for 85 years. 
As Secretary Wilbur Ross uh, alluded to uh, earlier uh, this morning, uh, essentially uh, the bank has been shut for about four and a half years, but thanks to the leadership of uh, President Trump, uh, we were confirmed in May, and I've been on the job six months now uh, with opening the bank up again. We're in Washington, D.C., 400 employees, and we want to help uh, be that special tool in the trade toolbox through direct loans, loan guarantees, export credit insurance, uh, and other programs to help uh, uh, you buy more made in USA goods. Thank you, Chairman Reed. That was uh, very elaborate, as, as I mentioned. <clears throat> well, we have heard from uh, many speakers this morning, including some of the head of government and leaders, how exciting the region is. Indo-Pacific is, uh, is loosely defined as the uh, countries in the Indian Oceans, as well as the Western countries in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Oceans. So as uh, from the stats, uh, I don't want to bore you with this, but uh, from since 2000, we, the, the Indo-Pacific region represents about 37 percent of global economy and, and growing to about 50 percent now. This is by our power uh, PPP parity. Uh, Two-thirds of the annual global economic growth in uh, the next five years are expected to come from this region. 50% of the world's seaborne trade is uh, loaded at Indo-Pacific ports, and two-thirds of those are unloaded within the area. And ASEAN, of course, is the heart, is at the heart of the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, countries. Uh, and we don't want to bore you with too much details, but you know how big ASEAN is. This has been said and... Uh, you can see from the, the events that is happening all throughout this week, the, the 10 countries, 650 million people, exploding opportunities in every area, exploding middle class, uh, exploding consumers, all the requirements and needs that are coming through on the uh, infrastructure, uh, soft, hard, digital infrastructure, uh, healthcare, soft side of the business, education, travel, or you name it. At uh, this round, I would like to invite uh, the panelists to give their remark and the view on how they see the opportunities and, of course, challenges in this uh, Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this time, I'm going to start with the ladies. Uh, Chairman Reed, if you'd like to uh, make your remark, sure. please. On behalf of the... Export-Import Bank of the United States, I would like to thank um, the sponsors for making us feel so welcome here today. I want to underscore President Trump's commitment to this vital region, which he outlined when he visited Vietnam in 2017. Vice President Pence reaffirmed that commitment last year at the East Asia Summit in Singapore. The President envisions a free and open Indo-Pacific a place where sovereign and independent nations with diverse cultures and many different dreams can all prosper side by side and thrive in freedom and in peace. For nearly a century, Exim has worked to turn such a vision into a reality. Exim has a proud and distinguished history of supporting American companies, large and small, in their efforts to do business in the Indo-Pacific. Exim approved its first transaction in this region more than 80 years ago. The agency approved a $22 million loan to China to assist in the construction of the historic Burma Road. In the decades since then, Exim has worked with countries throughout the region. In the wake of World War II, Exim helped with recovery efforts. Exim's first transaction with Vietnam was in 1956. The first transaction with Korea was in 1959. During the Asian financial crisis of, in the 1990s, Exim reaffirmed its commitment to the region by collaborating with other export credit agencies to help Indo-Pacific countries stay open for business but by providing the financing that the region needed. Since 2010, Exim has provided more than $41 billion in support of American businesses in the Indo-Pacific region, including LNG projects in places such as Australia, aircraft in Thailand, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Vietnam, turbine generators in India, and communication satellite in Vietnam. These projects positively impacted the lives of millions of people while also supporting thousands of good jobs at home, a win-win. As you may know, 
Exim is the official credit export agency of the United States. Our mission is to support U.S. jobs by helping businesses export American-made goods and services around the world. Exim's mission fits perfectly into the Trump administration's strategy for advancing two-way trade and investment in the Indo-Pacific region. As you just witnessed, we are pleased to update an already successful agreement with Nexi in order to open up even more mutually beneficial opportunities for the United States and Japan. This agreement allows Exim to help strengthen the energy security of Japan by opening up the potential for U.S. Japan Japanese financing of American LNG shipments to Japan. At the same time, it will foster more open and transparent markets for energy in the entire Indo-Pacific region, with both the United States and Japan observing transparency standards of the OECD. Nearly 25% of Exim's current board-level pipeline includes applications for exports to Asia, including the information and communication technology sector. Projects like this also build Exim, Exim's historic support of the U.S. commercial space industry, which reaped economic and security benefits for the United States and its partners in the Indo-Pacific region. These potential transactions would promote a private sector-led growth of the ICT industry and the development of increased connectivity in the region. When it comes to small business, Exim works to advance the goal of strengthening and improving trading relationships worldwide. To achieve that, we support U.S. companies of all sizes to facilitate the export of American-made goods and services to the Indo-Pacific region. Let me give you some examples. Classic American Hardwoods is a small business based in Tennessee, renowned for its hardwood lumber. We, our export credit insurance allowed the company to find new markets in the Indo-Pacific region, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Indonesia. Those increased exports led to increased sales, which allowed the Classic American Hardwoods to rehire workers it had been forced to lay off during the 2008 economic downturn. Last year, we celebrated our first term financing transaction in Cambodia. SCAFCO Grain Systems Company is a small business in Washington State that manufactures grain storage systems. The company has used XM financing since 1993, growing its overall sales and exporting to more than 80 countries. Last year, SCAFCO exported state-of-the-art grain silo to Bantam Bang, which will help the Cambodians in turn to increase their rice exports. In order to keep advancing our mission, Exim needs to be reauthorized by the United States Congress, and I really appreciate Secretary Wilbur Ross underscoring the importance that we get that done for the long term. Without legislative action, Exim's operating authority will expire on November 21st. I am engaged every day with congressional leaders to help ensure reauthorization so that we can continue to support U.S. small businesses. And we're committed to making the agency even better by implementing positive reforms to increase transparency and effectiveness. We look forward to working with our partners across the Indo-Pacific region and within the Trump administration to strengthen your economies by connecting you with quality made in the USA goods in services, and when needed, our loan guarantee and insurance programs to make these deals possible. This forum offers a platform for businesses and government officials to discuss how trade investment and economic cooperation can strengthen these ties, creating jobs and opportunities for the United States and our partners. We share similar objectives of supporting jobs and improving people's lives. Thank you again to the Thai government for hosting this important discussion and to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Thai Chamber of Commerce, American Chamber of Commerce in Thailand, and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for their work and for having us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Reed. You have a tall, a huge mandate. <laughs> we'll come around and, okay. uh, you know, get some discussion going. Okay. If I may invite Dr. Kovsak to uh, make his remark. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. 
the Indo-Pacific policy will be one of the most important initiative of the world. It comes at the most opportune time of the Asia Rising. So today, I, in preparation of my speech, instead of giving you a prepared speech, I will bring you a series of pictures to show you the expanding commercial opportunity in the Indo-Pacific. And all saying say that picture worth a thousand words. So let me give you some of um, a series of pictures quickly. Asia have changing very quickly because of the closer fiscal in integration. In this picture, you can see that the road condition in Thailand have changed very rapidly. Over the period of 10 years, the road that used to stop at the border have now connected to all the country in the regions. This has opened up a new opportunity like never before. In fact, this is not just in Thailand, but it's linked up for the whole Asia altogether. If you use Google Map and zoom into China, you can see a very good network of road connecting all the province together. And this exactly what you have seen in America in the year of 1850 to the year of 1890, where industrial revolution happening in America at that time. In the picture is the connectivity of the railroad. It's starting from 9,000 kilometers in the year of 1850. And by the year of 1890s, it reached almost 130,000 kilometers, and it's opening up all the opportunity like never before. The midways and all the secluded corner have become online. This is the era where you see big names like Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Mellon, Carnegie, Ford. That is the time when people become billionaire. And that time is exactly now in Asia. This is the time. If you want to become billionaire, you have to come here. And you come at the right place. It is the closer integration among the Asian country that is unleashing the unprecedented growth opportunity that you should not miss. In the center of Indo-Pacific policies is ASEAN. This is the area of 650 million people that will be one of the most exciting players for business over the next 15 years. And if you look at the growth rate, you can see that all of them growing quite well. 6%, 7%, 8%. And in fact, they have a good combination of the good old one, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore, and, in, and the new emerging country like the CLMV, and including Bangladesh, close by of 160 million people, also growing at 7%. This is almost 800 million people growing at 7 or 8% growth, and this growth, I can tell you as an economist, will be there for another 15 years. So. I'm telling you that this will become the third largest market in Asia with one of the best opportunity that is not second to China or India. And in fact, the FDI have already come to these regions, even surpassed India. If you look from the FDI flow into ASEAN from um, three, four years ago, it has increased almost 40, 50 percent. And when the FDI into China have been coming down. Let me tell you, in the case of Thailand, what we do to help forward the Indo-Pacific policies. I picked five initiatives from our side. For companies who decide to come to these regions, you need a home, a place to do business. We decide to embark on a new project 
three years ago is called Eastern Economic Corridor. This will be the place that second to none in this region in terms of infrastructure. It is located to the east of Bangkok, roughly half an hour from s u w a r n a p u m Airport to Chachung s a o and then maybe another half hour um, go down to the middle of the EEC area. This will be the center that link everyone together in the regions. This area used to be very successful um, and is continue to be very successful at this point in time. It is a home of almost 4,000 factory, the best petrochemical complex, top five in Asia, Detroit of the East, and also home to Pattaya area. To make it even better, we just signed a contract two weeks ago to create a high-speed rail link linking Bangkok and this Eastern Economic Corridor. Linking up the three airport together, the end of the high-speed rail link will be a new major airport. It's called an Uttapau Airport. This airport will raise the profile of Thailand in terms of connectivity hub, and it will make Thailand become, well, I think probably number one connecting point in Asia. In this airport, we we'll plan not just to have the airport. It will become an airport city with a new MRO center in the middle. We are also working on the Lam Chabang port. It will become a transshipment port for Indochina regions. The second initiative that we are doing is that not only we are building the home for business, but we are also building a new gateway for the business in Thailand. Over the past 20-30 years. The activity of Asia is centered on the east side, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea. But now the center of activity is now moving to South Asia, the b i m s t e k area. India, Bangladesh, Myanmar is growing quite well, and because of that, Thailand need a western gateway on the Indian Ocean so that we can send the product to those country quickly. In fact, if we continue to send from Lam Chabang Port that I showed you before, it will take almost 25 days to reach India. But if we go to the port in Ranong, it will cut down the time to four day to seven days. And because of this, it will become very important connecting point for all product in Asia and Southeast Asia to go out both sides. And we are also working very closely with the One b e l t One Road initiative, linking it up the SEC and the EEC with the One b e l t One Road, so that all the Chinese product, especially from Western China, can come down south and go out to the east and also to the west. In fact, the government already work with the Chinese government to build a high-speed rail link from Kunming, the Western China. Down to Bangkok, and this also will be another corridor in terms of road connectivities, linking up the product from the north and southern, well, western China, and also South China to come down to these regions. The road connection is quite good, as you can see. This is the bridge at the border. The third project that we are working on. Is the East Bay Corridor projects to link up Pacific Ocean and the Indian Oceans. So we already now working the, on the road from m o l a m e n g to Da Nang is almost completed, and in fact there will be also Southern Corridor from Ho Chi Minh City s um, to Da Wai later on. The fourth project that we are working on is to making sure that the Indochina region become closely connected, even more than. At this point in time, last year when we come the chair of the ACMEC, we talk to them and then help them endorse a new master plan of connectivities. In here, you can see the road connectivities. With the middle is the railroad connecting from east to west from um, Pacific Ocean to the Indian Oceans. This is the road connectivities 
the air connectivities, and in fact, the connectivity including energy and also internet. The final initiative that we have been working on is on how can we change Bangkok to become a regional international business center for all of you. You need a place for factories, but you need also a place for headquarters. So we decide to change Bangkok in a big way. If you come back here five years later, you will see Bangkok new skyline. Let me show you some of the pictures. This is new shopping mall in Thonburi area with a new high rise, the new tower, the new smart complex, one Bangkok. This is also another complex next door, which is by Dusitani. The Makassan complex will be going up, link up to the high speed rail link to EEC area, and also the Bang Su Grand Station. So this will really change Bangkok as a destination. And in fact, Subhanapum Airport, we have a new terminal. And based of all, we are planning to complete the subway network that we are working on for the last 17 years. Within five years from now, everything will be completed. But I told everyone that the traffic now will be from hell. But later on, it will be a very good place to live. This is the best investment opportunity in 20 or 30 years. So look at this. You can work on energy, um, power plant, hydro power in many places. And in fact, Myanmar needs a lot more. The urban center is popping up everywhere. And in fact, Tao have changed into a new urban centers. And with this, it means all of your products can sell here very well. And in fact, I just talked to Honeywell. He said, great business. And in fact, if you go to um, Phnom Penh, you can see that it's also growing up quite well. Almost 200 projects like this, wrapping in green. This is community mall in Yangkung. It's also very good. Um, new plantation. This is for palm oil plantation. Almost 100,000 acres on, well, on land. Uh, you can rent it for 99 years. And also new place for tourists. Let me give you some of the pictures. This is very beautiful, very virgin. You can decide to stay some more, right? Don't have to go back home, but you can go to, to this is going to Ranong, okay? Look at this, this is beautiful. So that's all I want to show you very quickly so that you can see that this is a great opportunity of the lifetime. This is the time that you have in America in 1850 to 1900. This is, that is the time when billionaires are made. That time is right here and now. So please come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kofsak. Very, very exciting. Lots of opportunities, and we are hoping to expand the commercial opportunities on this panel. Kun Ryan, would you like to make a brief remark? <clears throat> okay, good morning again, everyone. So one of the things about Honeywell is we're actually in the process of trans uh, transferring from a multinational industrial corporation to a pure technology corporation. We're even working in developing quantum computers in the near future, and that's a big part of our business plan going forward. So what I'd like to do is kind of level set you just a little bit more on what we're doing in the ASEAN region and then talk a little bit about where the opportunities are and maybe some thoughtful considerations when I'm discussing where we see the opportunities in the region. Uh, first of all, I mentioned that we had 10 manufacturing sites. Those are located in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. But we've also opened up what I would say is a world-class, very advanced cybersecurity lab in Singapore. The neat thing about this lab is we invite customers in to do training in what we would call red hat and blue hat training. It actually gives our customers a chance to attack other software, firmware, and use multiple servers manufactured by virtually every company in the world to see how robust their cybersecurity, especially from an industrial standpoint, processes are. 
We even invite the customers to bring in their own firmware and software that they utilize in a daily operation and allow us to see if we can uh, find holes in it. Within the region, we're producing the world's most advanced avionics, aircraft auxiliary power units, electrical components for advanced buildings, and we're even into worker safety. And it's important to understand some of that when I talk about where we think the opportunities are. We're even uh, producing advanced gas membranes that cleans CO2 from the natural gas production uh, process, which is especially important in Malaysia and Thailand, where high levels of CO2 exist in the LNG. Um, you know, ASEAN, it's truly one of our focus high growth regions. We're a $35 billion company last year, and the high growth regions, or the HGRs, generated almost 25% of that revenue worldwide. That's a very important number. All four of our businesses, aerospace, performance materials and technologies, building technologies, and our safety and productivity systems are represented in our HGRs. Uh, Ms. Reed is happy to know that Honeywell is also a very strong supporter of Exim. We're currently working a very large project in Iraq, which is at a gas recovery facility where oil or the, where the uh, uh, flared gas that's currently being released into the atmosphere is now going to be converted into electrical power. That also generates 1,400 job opportunities in the United States. So we would really like to duplicate that fantastic support by XM and bring that to the ASEAN region and have a good example here as well. So where do we see the opportunities? Obviously, it goes without saying from a smart city standpoint, a lot of the governments in the region are talking about it. We see smart grid, energy efficiency, security and waste management, all of areas that multiple countries have plans for rollout now and in the future. But we need to ensure that the partners that are able to execute have transparent and ethical behaviors, and most importantly, are technology experts with proven track records that can not only build to suit the project, but have an underlying foundation, as I mentioned, of strong cybersecurity experience. Secondly, the industrial internet of things. The digital economy by 2025, just in the ASEAN region, is gonna to grow to 240 billion. They also say in some of the statistics that they average 1.5 cell phones per person in the ASEAN region. Now some of you would ask, well, how does that work? How do you have 1.5 cell phones? If you have that question, I'll introduce you to my wife and then you'll see how we do that. Um, you know, from a smart manufacturing standpoint, 5G, smart logistics, all of the things that's gonna be necessary to support that digital economy is parts of what we're gonna be focused on in the near future. Aircraft manufacturing, airline growth, and the aerospace industry in general is another key area of focus. My colleague just put up a slide that showed a lot of the growth opportunities in a Thai 4.0 mission. Connected buildings, connected plants, using connected technology to allow decision makers to act fast and smart and make sure that everything from security to environmental control has predictive analytics, smart installations, and we reduce the downtime as much as possible. One thing that I think that the US companies such as Honeywell bring to the table is we don't just talk about big data. There's a lot of companies from different countries in the world talking about big data, but it's not about more data. It's about smart, useful, and actionable data, which I think we have the strength of, in, of inventing intelligent algorithms to pull that off. And then finally, we see a lot of importance on worker safety. If you think about the infrastructure growth that's gonna happen in the ASEAN region, we need to be good CSR advocates. We need to take care of the workers that are gonna build that infrastructure. State-of-the-art connected workers, allowing supervisors to monitor real-time hearing risk, actually see if the workers um, through embedded technology are properly utilizing their safety equipment, and remote monitoring from anywhere in the world 
of that individual worker's air quality are all areas that Honeywell focuses in. And finally, to pull this all off, we've created a fourth or a fifth unit supporting the four Honeywell businesses that already has over 4,000 employees. 50% of those are software engineers and program managers called the Honeywell Connected Enterprise. And we think that's a really good example of what's going to be needed to pull this off and support the ASEAN region in our growth. Kopkum Kraft, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Jay? Great. I'm already tall. I don't know that I need to stand up on this, but... Um, so, so first of all, I've been coming to the region since 1982, and I should have known that moderated panel translated into Thai meant prepared remarks. Um, but I'm going to speak extemporaneously for a second on, on really how city views the region and uh, spare you a little bit the commercial um, of city. We have 30,000 people in the region and are extraordinarily committed. But let me just talk a minute about how we transform the disruption that is going on um, into extraordinary transformational opportunity. And I'll talk just on three uh, of the main drivers of that transformation and, and disruption. One is tech and digital, the other is ecosystems, and the third is sustainability. So first, in terms of digital, um, we view digital and tech transformation as a new horizontal cutting across virtually every aspect of society, industry, verticals, every business that you're in, um, transforming, transforming trade and commercial opportunities in this region, um, whether it's 5G, IoT, microgrids, mesh networks, we're seeing the use of technology in business, driving business growth. There's an, there is an estimate uh, that ranges from 250 billion to 650 billion of incremental tech opportunity in the ASEAN region by McKinsey. You could drive a truck through that number, but given the, the magnitude, either way, even 250 billion is, is ginormous. And that's incremental investment. Um, so if you take AI, artificial intelligence is being bolted into your business pretty much across the board. Um, I just saw numbers that 24% of the businesses in Indonesia alone are already using artificial intelligence. We're seeing, particularly in ASEAN, the, the connectivity, internet, and mobile uh, opportunity into the financial and, and payment space, fintech, um, alternative payment mo modalities, transforming how we think not just about e-commerce, but how we think about the bottom of the pyramid of connecting and delivering banking services uh, and inclusivity to the lowest end of the pyramid that gives us an opportunity when combined with, with connectivity um, that will be critical for, for the future of the region. Um, so tech represents potentially 15 to 17 million disrupted or lost jobs in the region, but we think if we think in terms of future of jobs um, that it can create much more. Um, second is what, what we call um, ecosystem transformation, and there's two components to that. One is um, connectivity through infrastructure, and the second is supply chain disruption. Um, due to the trade friction, due to what's happening with infrastructure connectivity, supply chains are, are moving, and they're moving at an extraordinary space, pace. The first thing that happened with, with um, uh, over the past 18 months is ASEAN started to use its spare capacity at a much faster rate. And we've seen in the past quarter 24 major announcements of new um, supply chain investments um, in the ASEAN region. And what's happening there is, is that we've actually used that spare capacity. So you that are clients in, in the ASEAN region of city are actually now in the boardroom looking at new investment um, and investments that will create new capacity, new jobs, and new growth. In fact, we are estimating that due to the disruption for every 10% 
of movement in supply chains due to the trade frictions, that that's 0.5% incremental ASEAN growth. Um, so there will be new jobs and investment, and we've only seen the beginning of that. Um, most importantly, perhaps, though, is what was talked about earlier by um, the Deputy Secretary General Kabsak um, in terms of the Eastern Economic Corridor. And I want to point that out as an extraordinary example of why we're seeing so much growth and innovation, not just historically, but, but going forward. So there are 1,600 um, registered zones, hubs, uh, uh, clusters of economic, new economic activity in the ASEAN region. And those clusters are, are, think of them as ecosystems that are liquid ecosystems. They're connecting with brand new infrastructure. Um, integrated comprehensive infrastructure plays and they're connecting between them. The second thing that's happening is, is these hubs are, are digitizing. They're going in large scale innovation. If you look at EEC here in Thailand, for example, it's 12 industries and these aren't old school industries. This is the future of autos, it's the future of, he of health, it's ag tech, it's biotech, it's every one of the future job creating industries. And when you put them together on a blank piece of paper, meaning that you throw away the legacy and you go into these zones and you create corridors that connect those zones, you create innovation that scales at a much faster pace. And it's really the kind of thing that when it happens, it allows ASEAN to drive growth at, what, 160 to 250 basis points higher than global growth just because of, of what's happening in that innovation. Um, we see sustainability as a, third, uh, as a third opportunity. Yes, it's an extraordinary challenge, and I, I and, and City um, want to compliment the leadership of Thailand and the sustainability report um, under its leadership. So yes, we have a, a sustainability challenge, CO2, uh, GHC emissions in the region are growing at double the rate of the population. Um, we have uh, air pollution that is five to ten times what the World Health Organization thinks is acceptable levels. As you all know, we have problems with everything from water waste and, and plastic in the region. This also represents opportunity. Uh, sustainability investment will be extraordinarily large in this region and globally, but just to give you a sense of, of what that can mean, just in Asia alone, we're expecting $700 billion worth of investment just to go into renewable buildings, just one small segment. Um, when you look at uh, uh, EV or electronic vehicles and hybrid vehicles, we're expecting $320 billion in the Asia region to go into that alone. So we're talking about trillions of dollars of incremental investment that will be put into sustainability in the ASEAN region, um, inside and out. And final point, um, I, I would just say, and, and to thank Kimberly for her remarks, uh, City sees Exum as an extraordinary partner uh, for us uh, in bringing U.S. companies and UN, U.S. investment to the region. All three of these trends really represent incremental investment opportunities to partner in new ways between the public and the private sectors um, to form new alliances as we build new corridors, new infrastructure investment, new innovative growth opportunities that are more sustainable. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Wow, very exciting from every front. I think we have uh, even more in-depth discussion on digital and infrastructure down the, uh, down the uh, following the later part of the day. I like to, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but I just uh, pose some questions here. What, what do you see, you know, any one of you, what do you see as the main conditions that must happen in order to accelerate, you know, what we are talking about here to become a reality? What do you think uh, some of the key, you know, policy or, you know, the structure changes that is required for this to happen? Anyone? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just take a, a quick run at that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that the governments have to do in the region is really be thoughtful about how we can make sure that we're promoting, retaining, and training the students of the future. If you think about the long-term objectives of what needs to happen and all of the opportunities in the region, 
Right now, about 60,000 students from the ASEAN region are going to the United States each year. How many of those students are coming back? Do we have enough high-value work to entice them to come back and work in the region? I think that's one of the things that's key for the governments to help make sure that they're incentivizing and regulate, as well as private industry to make sure they're putting that type of value-added work in the region. And secondly is diversity. Um, when we talk about diversity in the U.S., it doesn't mean the same as diversity in the ASEAN region. One of the things that I'd like to do is, and we're building out infrastructure on my team, I would be extremely happy if from a gender standpoint, all of the engineers, all of the program managers, the vice presidents, and the leaders of that department are female. And I think there's a long way to go in the ASEAN region for that, but it's definitely a focus of Honeywell, and I think it's something that we all in the audience, delegates, as well as both public and private should be focused on. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah, uh, I guess I would challenge the public and the private sector to break glass in terms of how we work together. Um, one of the things I mentioned that these economic corridors, economic zones, um, you know, a lot of them are moving so fast because they're not legacy and governments are putting into them faster accelerated mechanisms to make decisions to make decisions, to take bureaucracy out, um, to reduce regulatory burdens, and to allow the private sector to move. So, um, but we can't do that everywhere. So half of our population in this region is in urban centers, and that's growing at an extraordinary pace. In fact, we're talking about another 70 million between now and 2025 in urban centers. Well, there you've got legacy. And when you start talking about what has to be done to provide sustainable investment um, for those populations. Um, you do ha we, we have to be able to come together and work on plans and strategies. Secretary Ross uh, asked me yesterday, what do I think was s slowing down the uh, smart city concept? Smart being smarter um, in terms of technology, smarter in terms of sustainability, and, and, and more smartly financed. Well, part of that is, is just we haven't figured out how to take government plans and private sector innovation into those smart cities and innovate fast enough. So we're going to have to come up with new modalities of working together better, smarter, faster. Very good, very good suggestions. Yes, Dr. Kapsa, please. I, I agree with the issue of human resources. I think Thailand also have this problem uh, in attracting foreign investors into Thailand. Um, many people said, I want to come, but you don't have the required skilled labor um, in your countries. This is the most important issue that we are working on over the past couple of years. But another thing that I have been tasked myself is on the change of the regulation. Many people who would like to come to Thailand, they run into the obstacle of the law, would, not pro uh, would prohibit people to do that. Um, and in fact, some of the law are very much outdated. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have begun a process called guillotine. Basically, we would like to cut out all the bad law, bad regulation, and try to empower the people to be able to do the business as they like to do. Uh, in fact, uh, we have been working with um, a new sandbox in, for the, some, of the fin, some of the fintechs. Mm. And um, at the same time, uh, we are also working on a, a new law for the future, as I told you before. Uh, the digital law is very important. To move ahead into the futures, you cannot rely on the analog mode like before. You have to move into the 4.0 era, and the law still say that you need paper, mm -hmm. and you need a real signature. <laughs> we have to get out of those things, mm -hmm. and then um, allow the, the youngster and also the startup to uptake and then, mm -hmm. um, and then expand the opportunity. So basically, I think we have to work both in terms of human resource, but also try to work on um, reduce the mm. regulatory burden mm. on the business people. Mm. And in fact, in this front, Thailand has been quite good. I mean, um, we have good results. We work hard, and then um, our ranking go up from roughly 50 mm. ranking in ease of doing business. Mm. And now it stands at 21, mm. um, an improvement almost 30 ranking in the in last two or three years alone. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
more rooms to go. Yeah. I guess <laughs> I would read? like to just uh, close on this topic by uh, the importance not only of uh, the private sector innovating, but also uh, the government innovating. And with the honor of uh, reopening Exim, uh, six months ago, uh, the very first board meeting where we voted on deals was a Honeywell project in Iraq. Thank you for, for mentioning that. We also voted uh, recently on the largest deal in Exim's history, a $5 billion LNG deal to transform the country of Mozambique. And uh, I've also heard, though, that our domestic LNG uh, companies in the United States want to be able to export to you. So uh, we hosted a round table with our domestic companies in Washington and really are thinking hard about that. We want to be open for business wherever uh, there is a need. Uh, we have a reputation with financing just certain types of industries, and uh, that's not the case. We want to be supportive wherever there's a need. Jay outlined, uh, you know, three key areas, and we really want to focus in on that. And so I want to challenge all of the U.S. companies in the audience uh, to come speak with us at XM if uh, there's a role we can play to help you sell your goods around the world. Yes, thank you. Um, Brian. You mentioned uh, on the aerospace industries, you're the aerospace man. You want to say something, comment on the aerospace uh, landscape in this region? Um, yeah, maybe a quick, quick comment on, on just the aerospace, airports, infrastructure. One of the things that we're going to have to really watch out for is making sure that uh, we treat the aerospace growth, especially when we're talking airlines, passengers, um, the capacity, the tourist dossier on the business traveler, we need to think about the entire infrastructure as one. My fear, the things that I have sleepless nights are, we build this brilliant airport that is extremely passenger friendly, high, highly secure, and moves passengers through the airport at an accelerated rate like we've never seen before, mm -hmm. yet we don't pay attention to the air side, the taxiways, the ramp. We don't have advanced taxi guidance systems in there we're still using verbal air traffic controllers uh, guidance to the airplane rather than digital controlled lights, which can be ex you know, especially um, important in areas where English is a second language. It can allow the aircraft to operate faster and safer. And then also in the airspace itself, not only within the country, but intra-country airspace, making sure that we're unlocking all of the opportunities, for example, that exist in the Boeing flight management system, using time-based arrivals so that the aircraft are actually orchestrated mm -hmm. to a specific time and space with satellite navigation and advanced digital flight controls mm -hmm. so that we actually have all the aircraft moving throughout the region in a narrow yet safe corridor and they all arrive at a certain waypoint at an exact specific time. Mm -hmm. It's using technology on board the airplane and on the ground that will allow us to do that, but we need to be really careful thinking about this as a bigger problem than just modernizing an airport. Thank you. Well, I, I do have a lot of questions, but I'm, wind, I'm mindful that we are standing between lunch and, uh, and us. But let me just uh, try and sum up a little bit. So in order to you know, see the full realization of the Indo-Pacific uh, commercial, opportunities. I think we have to work on education system. We have some of the, uh, the red tapes. I think that's a big thing to reduce, to get rid of, upgrade technology, upgrade most of the systems in uh, key of the infrastructure areas. Any um, last comment before uh, we try and close this up? Yeah. I just say one word about a different kind of connectivity and that is financial connectivity because I think that the, one of the most important segments of the economy to drive growth is the SMEs. Um, and when we connect through alternative payment models, the SME ecosystem, um, it gives them the potential to move data and money faster, transparency with control and audit. Um, so our approach at City is to partner with FinTech. It is to take our pipes, which move three to tri six trillion dollars around the world a day, um, appropriately from a regulatory, anti-counter-financial um, terrorism and uh, money laundering context to be able to bolt the best compliance um, controls, but to also take advantage of the technologies, these uh, QR codes, um, 
real-time payments, the advances that SWIFT is making with SWIFT GPI to have full transparency on cross-border payments, but to bolt all of that into these alternative payment models that we're seeing in the, in the Asia region. And we think that that fundamentally will drive growth at a level of the economy that we haven't seen before, um, and it will feed and enable the SMEs that are fundamental to the ASEAN region. Yes, Dr. Kopsa, please. I think, I think the lesson I learned from working with politicians over the past four or five years is that we have to focus on making things happen. I mean, when you talk to politicians, they will have a lot of beautiful words, a lot of good plans. But, but at the end, at the end of the day, to get everything happen, you have to focus on several things, two or three things at most, and get it done. And if you can get it done, then you move on to the next target. I think the key difference of the quality of the government is how to get it done. And in fact, when you listen to Thomas Edison, they said success is 1% imagination and 99% perspiration. So I think that's exactly what we have to do. We have to work very hard, focus on implementation, and get things done. Yep, that was always in the detail. <laughs> comment? Any last comment? If not. Just looking forward to working with all of you. I think we did very well on our timing. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to our uh, panel here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Batomsak and distinguished panelists for such a great start to the Indo-Pacific Business Forum. It is now time for lunch. Please remain seated and your lunch will be served to you at your seat. There will be no food provided in the foyer area. The program will start back in 45 minutes and we have five panel discussions this afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.